Uh, we are ready to move on to our next presenter. Uh, and Deborah, I see that you've turned on your microphone. Uh, let me give you just a little bit of introduction. Um, Deborah is an assistant professor uh, in public health sciences at Clemson University. Um, she comes to us uh, today from South Carolina. And <clears throat> Deborah has been working, <clears throat> pardon me, in the fields of uh, epidemiology, environmental health, and uh, uh, she is the perfect one to uh, talk about our, um, our next topic, which is uh, just lovely to talk about this time of year, miasma and death. Please, Deborah, go right ahead. All right. Well, thank you for letting me be part of this afternoon. As someone who has taught epidemiology for 20 years, of course, John Snow is, as Sandra said earlier, the man. Um, I've been telling my students that, you know, they need to know this fact this week. So I'm glad to be here. Um, I, excuse me if I'm a little bit hoarse. And I have a squeaky chair. So when you hear sounds in the back, it's my chair, I promise. <laughs> All right, let me go ahead. I had sort of inherited that title. And um, oh, I can see I'm going to have some formatting issues, but we'll just deal with those. Um, as you've heard today, several times that Jon Snow was sort of bucking the prevailing attitude of the time. And so I wanted to make sure that I spent some time talking to you about how, about the power of how people, of what they believe will cause disease or how there are different theories of disease causation. And they have a power over those who adhere to one view or the other. And of course, Snow was living during a pivotal time when we were sort of still clinging to a very strong theory that was still very much the, the majority opinion. Um, some examples of earlier disease causation theories, um, some of the early ones, evil eye, demonic possession. Whenever you have a theory, then it, you know, it predicts the, the preventative actions that you should do. So of course, when we used to believe that people became possessed by evil spirits, we would drill holes in their heads, the process of trepanation, to let that was the cure to get the, and the, the amazing thing about that is people survived that treatment. Um, Hippocrates, of course, is credited with sort of having the first environmental-based or rational theory of his four humors, and disease happens when you have the humors out of balance. So, of course, things like, you know, bleeding, with leeches or bleeding in some way would make sense to reestablish balance. Um, but what I really stress with giving those examples is you have to understand the power that this sort of a belief has. And it was Thomas Kuhn who came up with the term paradigm, that the paradigm is really the entire world view or perspective that you have, almost like a set of spectacles or glasses that it's how you're trained to view and see and interpret the world. And it will have the same blind spots that your glasses will have where you just can't see certain things because you've, you've not been trained to look at them. For example, with this picture, if I only ever taught you about ducks and trained you to view ducks, you'd never see the bunny rabbit that's also in the view. And that's a good way to kind of view a paradigm and understand what people were thinking. And of course, we need to be careful that a hundred years from now, they'll wonder what we were thinking. Now, Thomas Kuhn also talked about with these paradigms, when there is a shift in a belief system, it doesn't happen easily. Um, things, some people will never accept the change. And um, so, you know, there really has to be a crisis where too many anomalies or inconsistencies with the theory are present. That sort of your newer thinkers to the field accept a new opinion. But there will be those who basically have to die out with their existing opinion. All right. And at the time of snow, miasma theory was very much the prevailing paradigm. And it had been probably from the 1600s on. Um, again, just a review. Miasma basically referred to foul smells or emanations, sewer gas, garbage fumes. I mean, remember what London was looking like in the mid-1800s or any of these major cities. Sewage down the center. You can imagine that there were plenty of bad fumes. And the idea was that if they breathed in a bad fume, a sewer gas miasma, their humors would get disturbed and they'd get sick. And of course, then the treatment prevention would be to avoid 
miasmas, avoid breathing the foul air, maybe you shouldn't be there in the first place, what were you doing in that location, there were all sorts of sort of moralistic opinions that went with it, and of course the cure of breathing good air, which is where we get ring around the rosy, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, and you know, we all fall down, is related to, you know, posies and smelling good air to keep yourself safe. Now, contagion theory had been emerging as an alternative to miasma, even back to the 16th century with Fracastorius, or Fracastoro, they made up their names then anyway, but he had termed the he had come up with the term contagion. Um, von Leeuwenhoek, of course, had his microscope to help us show the presence of germs, which he called animalcules. For some reason, I really like that term for bacteria and germs. Um, Semmelweis, you know, came along and had this idea that there must be something that the medical students were taking from cadavers to pregnant ladies when they were delivering them and, you know, came up with this concept of cadaverous animalcules or particulates that, of course, he recommended washing your hands. So very important things were emerging, but very much in the minority. And the fact that John Snow was aware of this just tells you what a researcher he was. He must have been reading quite a bit of material to keep up with the emerging theories. Um, I do like to give credit, though, to the some of the major adherents to the miasma theory at the time were our wonderful sanitary, sanitary reformers that did a lot of good. You can hear Florence Nightingale in this category. Um, Chadwick, who pretty much established sort of a structure for public health. William Farr contributed so many things to gener uh, vital statistics keeping and the international classification of disease coding. Um, we had Shattuck here in the United States. Now, they all were sanitary reformers, all major adherents to the miasma theory, um, but they did a lot of good. Now, of course, one thing which, again, with our current blinders, I'm not quite sure why they had to have such a decidedly anti-contagionist perspective as part, but again, it's hard to understand something you can't see and something you can smell probably made a lot more sense. So that's what was sort of going on in the world of Jon Snow when these cholera outbreaks occurred. He did, as we've heard, Publish in two different places, actually, more in a lay literature and also in a medical journal in, 19, in 1849, his observations on cholera. He, was, he definitely was more inclined toward contagion. Um, and he had some very interesting observations in that, um, those publications. He was able to look at sort of these inconsistencies with a miasmatic explanation for an outbreak. At the micro scale, he had discussed the Surrey building tenement, basically, which backed up to the Truscott Court tenement. Um, they were equally destitute sort of tenements, um, people doing the same occupations living there. But in the one, the Surrey building, I believe there were like 20 deaths, whereas in the Truscott Court one, there was there was one basically from cholera, and so and the only real difference is that they each had their own pump, and so at that micro scale he was able to start to say that that's an inconsistency in some of our theories. At the macro scale, you've heard about a couple times now about the different water companies that were providing different regions of London, um, the Southwick and I can never say the names correctly, um, but basically you had these two different kind water companies that would provide different areas and of course one was pulling their, well, accessing their water from south of London and so it had quite a bit of the sewage of London in it and one was getting their resource above. But uh, let me just share related to this stuff, one of the comments he had in his publication about this natural experiment. The experiment was on the grandest scale, no fewer than 300,000 people of both sexes, of every age and occupation, and every rank, and every station from gentle folks down to the very poor, divided into two groups without their knowledge or choice, one group being supplied with water containing the sewage of London, and the other having water quite free of such impurity. And of course he looked at the rates, and your chance of dying from cholera was eight and a half times greater if you were receiving the one source of water. So. 
very impressive at the macro scale to also be able to view these things. Of course, you'd like to say he published that and everyone stood up and cheered, but as you can see, he really still failed to convince the leading medical and political officers of London at the time with his articles. Their arguments were that the wind was blowing one direction versus the other, and that he really had not shown that these disease rates could that he had not shown that there was a, some other explanation besides emanations to explain the disease rates. And I put in this next little bullet just as an explanation of what was still going on at the time. They did have an 1851 sanitary convention right there in London, and they actually asked the disruptive contagionist group to leave. So you can imagine that there was a ruckus going on and they were arguing against it. And so John Snow was not alone in his trying to stand up or buck the system. And my sense is John Snow may have been actually a little too apolitical and reserved to have been much a part of this rowdiness. But there is definitely, as you could take, sort of early signs of revolution going on. As I say here, Snow, as a consummate researcher, just waited to get more evidence. And so, of course, we have the massive cholera outbreak that occurs in 1854. We've heard different statistics about that. It's just hard to imagine a place where you might have 70 deaths in one day from cholera, just 500 over the course of about a week or two. It's hard to imagine the impact that had. Um, but it did provide Snow with an opportunity to do a little more of the epidemiologic approach of comparing the sick to the healthy. And I like to stress that most of the data he used came from William Farr. And the fact that Farr not only documented where, de where deaths occurred, but whether they were from cholera or not. And so my next slide is the, the famous sort of ghost map picture. I got this one from Stephen Johnson's book of the same title. But you can see that the black lines, let's see if I can do a pointer here. The black lines are death in a house from cholera. And so you have places like this workhouse here, which housed, oh, I forget the statistic, maybe 500 people, but you had a total of only four or five deaths happen there. You have the brewery here with not a single death. Of course, they weren't probably sleeping there at night. They haven't recorded there, but with no deaths documented. Oh, someone's adding little highlights. Thank you. Um, so, And of course, here's our pump. But I wanted to just show that this data was demonstrating how many deaths were, of course, near the pump, but also how many were in sort of far-reaching areas around. And he was able to chart this. And as um, I believe Mike said earlier, the shoe leather epidemiology of tracking down what was going on with cases far away versus those right next beside it. All right. And that really did give him some compelling evidence to work with. He had the evidence, again, of those who were there on Broad Street who got sick, but he had those on Broad Street who had managed to stay well, and they have documentation of people who just said they didn't like the taste of the water, or you have the workhouse which had its own pump on the premises so they did not have to go to the Broad Street pump. You had the drinkers at the brewery pretty much drinking beer when they were in that vicinity, and then if they lived somewhere else, they weren't at risk at night from their source of water. So I've always liked it. They had, you know, moral of the lesson, need to have beer to stay well from these germs. Um, and then perhaps more compelling to his critics is that Snow did track down those who died within the same outbreak period who didn't live near the Broad Street pump. He was able to find um, that this one widower Susanna Eli, I believe was her name, had lived there originally and had moved away, but she still had her sons bring her water from the Broad Street pump on a weekly basis, and she unfortunately perished during this outbreak. And you also had school children who were in residence there on Broad Street during the day and would have had their water at that time, even though they lived other places. So very compelling evidence for his critics that it couldn't be a smell that traveled that far but the water definitely could go that far. So with more evidence and sort of, again, clout has a lot to do with it, he was able to successfully argue for the removal of access to the Broad Street pump. The handle was removed on September, I have it as the 7th or the 8th, by the, um, he convinced the Board of Guardians of St. James, James Parish. Um, 
and as I said earlier, he really was arguing against an ingrained paradigmatic view of what could be making sense here um, and, and setting the stage for, again, more of a revolution in theory. Of course, as an epidemiologist, I have to include this slide that we now do revere Jon Snow for pretty much acting out all the steps that we would like to see even modern day epidemiologists do, that you first dis assess the distribution or patterns of disease. You're looking, for the, you're looking at the where and the when to, in order to hopefully figure out the why which is, of course, identifying the determinant of disease. And he didn't know that it was a vibrio, but he knew that there was something in the water. And of course, a real, and then as well, advocating for public health action once you're convinced that there's a way to make a difference. So we have to include that one as our definition of epidemiology there. I do like to end, though, with this point that the miasma paradigm still continued to be pretty powerful in the prevailing theory for a few more decades after Jon Snow. So he didn't really usher in our acceptance of germ theory. We really had to wait for an even more prominent um, individual, of course, Louis Pasteur, who was so revered by his country for his contributions. Um, so Snow certainly helped move us along and certainly helped bring attention to water as a source of contagion. Um, but I also like to just, again, give a little credit back to the sanitary reformers such as Chadwick and Farr. Without Farr, I'm not sure that Snow would have even had the data to do what he needed to do. And to quote a term that I had seen in an article by Pizzi, you know, these apostles of cleanliness did make a big difference in great contributions, you know, to urban health and sanitation. Th their science might have been misguided or wrong, but some of their actions still did make a big difference. And so I like to, <laughs> and I think in my sense is that Jon Snow was able to get along with and, and converse um, with this group as well. All right. Any questions? I talk kind Thank of you fast. very much. I appreciate that, Deborah. Um, we, um, we have some time for questions. If anybody does have any, I see some applause. Very nice. <laughs> the applause emoticon is very, very nice in this case. Uh, very good. Thank you. Thank you for the applause. <laughs> I love your experiences for people. Yes. And I really do love thinking about the, 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 you have to think what was inside their head. And like I said, they're going to look at us and wonder what we were thinking in another hundred years. And Lindsay, years. of course, says, thanks. And I loved hearing that beer saved some people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's always nice to know. Indeed, that's true. Of course, uh, uh, people did uh, resort to uh, beverages that were fer fermented in order to, uh, to, to kill the organisms. They didn't know it, but they knew it was healthier than drinking water. Any other questions or comments? All right, Deborah, thank you so much. Sure. I appreciate uh, the presentation.